All right, uh, Luke Acts for Beginners. This is lesson number 18, Persecution of the Church, part two of this section, Acts chapter eight, verse one to nine, 43. So in our last lesson, we saw the beginning of the persecution of the church as Peter and the apostles uh, were arrested, they were beaten. And of course, Stephen was stoned to death by an angry mob, including um, some of the Jewish uh, leaders. This uh, violence is going to continue as a persecution of the entire church, not only its leaders uh, ensues. So let's uh, check our outline, make sure uh, we know exactly where we are in our, uh, in our study. Uh, we're studying the ministry of Peter, and this is the fifth section, uh, the persecution of the church. So we pick up the story in Acts chapter nine with the introduction of Saul, an early persecutor of the church. So let's begin reading, uh, actually back in chapter eight, uh, verse one. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death, and on that day a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. So note that Luke, uh, what Luke says about Saul's attitude and actions. Uh, he enthusiastically agreed with the killing of Stephen. And since this was so, it was natural for him to want to destroy all Christians in the same manner, if you don't mind killing one of the leaders, you don't mind killing the followers. Also, on the day of Stephen's death, Saul begins a persecution campaign without restraint or mercy. Both men and women are dragged, the idea of violence here, dragged from their homes and imprisoned. Luke mentions that it was this persecution that sent Christians fleeing from Jerusalem to other safer parts of the country, for example, Many went to Samaria where the Sanhedrin had no authority. Stephen is uh, properly buried and the apostles, not afraid of Saul, remain in Jerusalem because that's where the bulk of their, uh, of their church remains and where their work is, is centered. So we keep reading chapter eight. Therefore those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. So Luke now introduces another main character in the early church, Philip, who along with Stephen was one of the original uh, seven uh, deacons. Uh, the persecution sends Philip to Samaria, again, a place where he would not have gone to as a Jew. He, you know, he would never have gone there as a Jew, but as a Christian, uh, he does go to Samaria. As a Christian, he not only travels there, but he begins to share the gospel with these people that the Jews would not even talk to, let alone minister. Uh, the Jews wouldn't talk to him, wouldn't minister to them, but, but, but Philip is sent there you know, through the persecution. He not only talks to them, but he preaches Christ to them. Now, the Holy Spirit empowered Philip to perform signs and healings to confirm the word that he spoke, and people responded uh, to his message uh, in, in, great, in great numbers. Notice that this was done through the laying on the hands of the apostles. Remember back in Acts chapter six, verse six, it says that the apostles laid hands on these, uh, on these deacons. And two of them so far, as we have seen, Stephen and Philip both were able to perform signs and wonders. So let's keep reading, verse nine. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, this man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. 
and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip, and as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So at this point, Luke focuses on one convert in particular, Simon, a magician. He was highly regarded as a practitioner of the black arts. Uh, magic, of course, is the attempt to manipulate or influence the spirit world for your benefit or the harm of others by doing something in the material world. For example, you know, I'm going to carry my lucky penny around with me and this will cause the spirits to uh, bring me good fortune. Of course, that's a simple example, but basically that's what, that's what magic is. You're doing something, a ritual, you've got a lucky thing, uh, you, words, uh, incantations, whatever, ceremonies, in order to affect what is going on in the spiritual world, as I say, for your own benefit or perhaps for the, for the harm of others. The Bible, however, forbids all forms of the practices of magic and the occult. Uh, Exodus chapter 7, verses 11 and 12, Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 to 12, and also in the New Testament, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. And I want to give you some general definitions of these practices and the scriptures that forbid them. Because people, you know, a lot of times when we talk about this particular topic, they say, where does it say in the Bible that you're not allowed to do this or not allowed to do that? So I thought maybe of giving you a list with the appropriate scriptures. So here we go. Uh, enchantments, which, uh, are the, uh, uh, which are the practice of the magical arts, Deuteronomy 18. Uh, witchcraft, another term for that is soothsaying or magic. 2 Corinthians 33, uh, uh, 2 Chronicles, excuse me, 33 verse 6. Sorcery. Sorcery is just another word for witchcraft. Uh, um, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 27 verse 9. Verse nine. Uh, divination. Again, another term for divination is fortune telling. 2 Kings chapter 17, 17. Wizardry, which is another form of uh, witchcraft, male witchcraft actually, a male witch, a wizard is a male witch. Exodus 22 verse 18, necromancy, which is uh, uh, the seance, you know, communicating, with the, uh, communicating with the dead, 1 Chronicles 10, 13, 14. Charming, another word for charming, casting spells, Isaiah 19, 3. Stargazing, again, another word for astrology, Isaiah 47, 12 to 15, and imagery. Uh, the use of images from these practices um, for logos or for, um, uh, for decoration or for branding. Uh, these are forbidden by God because those who do and use magic are trying to do with magic. In other words, they're appealing to spiritual power and any type of spiritual power which is not God's power is Satan's power. So they're, they're appealing to spiritual power to do the things that we ought to do through prayer to God. So God refers to all of these practices as an abomination, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 16. So Luke writes that like all disciples, Simon believes the gospel and he is baptized as a result, verse 13. So let's read verses 14. It says, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, so this passage is better understood if we review the meaning of the two terms described as the work of the Holy Spirit here. Remember previously we were talking about the indwelling and the empowering? Well, understanding the difference between these two things helps us to understand this passage. So the indwelling, the indwelling, the Spirit of God dwells within the Christian. When does that happen? When that individual becomes a Christian, Acts 2.38, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the indwelling, happens at baptism. Empowering, empowering is where the Holy Spirit enables you to do miracles or speak in tongues or do healings. That's the empowering. 
And I had mentioned previously that sometimes the writers use an expression like receiving the Holy Spirit, use that expression. Sometimes they use that expression to refer to one of these two things, either the indwelling or the empowering. And the problem is they use the same expression in reference to both of these things. And so you have to examine the context to know which he is referring to. So in verses 16 and 17, Luke writes that the Samaritans had been baptized in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it means that at that moment, according to Acts 2.38, they also received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He says they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. So they were forgiven of their sins, they had the indwelling. This being so, the other blessing of the Spirit that they, you know, he says that they received the Holy Spirit, refers to the empowering by the Holy Spirit since they'd already received the indwelling. You know, why did they send for the apostles? They already had been baptized, they already had the indwelling. Well, they sent for the apostles because the apostles were the only ones who could confer on them the empowering. So note that they received empowerment at the laying on of the apostles' hands. So Philip sends for the apostles because he could baptize them, which would bring them the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, but only the apostles could transfer the empowerment of the Holy Spirit through the imposition or through the laying on of their hands. And one other little note, notice it says the apostles sent Peter and John. Does that sound like Peter is some kind of chief apostle that makes decisions? You know, it was the wisdom of the apostles. They said, you know, let, let's send a, a, a Peter and John. So Peter and John were sent by the other apostles. More a, a collegiate type of, a collegial type of, uh, of uh, leadership there. But anyways, just a, just a small point that I want to make. So this is an important point. This here, you know, empowerment, indwelling. This is an important point to understand because it is the basis for the teaching on modern day miracles. So here's the breakdown of this teaching. The Holy Spirit empowered only the apostles, and as we will learn later on in chapter 10, Cornelius. So the Holy Spirit empowered only the apostles and Cornelius with the ability to speak in tongues, to heal, to do miracles. The apostles, as we see here, also had the ability to transfer this empowerment, you know, to speak in tongues and to heal and so on and so forth. They had the ability to transfer this empowerment to other disciples through the laying on of their hands. The, these disciples, however, who had received this empowerment from the apostles, did not have the ability to themselves empower other people by the laying on of their hands. And we see this phenomenon here, we see an example of this with Philip. This is why even though Philip himself could perform signs and wonders, he could not enable another disciple to do the same. Only the apostles could do this. And for this reason, they came to help Philip and empower his converts uh, to practice the spiritual gifts. One other kind of postscript to this, with the death of the apostles, the performance of miracles began to uh, diminish uh, and eventually ceased because the way to receive this empowerment also ended with the passing of the apostles. So briefly to summarize, the apostles received the empowerment. They could transfer that empowerment to other individuals and they did. We see Philip and we see Stephen, for example, and now you know, uh, the converts that Philip had, the apostles came, laid hands on them, and some of them began to speak in tongues and to prophecy and so on and so forth. So they had this empowerment. But once they died, the way to receive the empowerment died with them. This is the reason why we believe and we teach that the age of miracles has passed because the way to receive the ability to do those miracles has also passed, has passed when the apostles uh, passed away from the scene. Okay, so let's keep reading, verse 18. 
It says, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me yourselves so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So Simon, notice here, Simon sees that the transfer of spiritual power is done by the laying on of hands of the apostles. He sees the, the ones uh, empowered speaking in tongues and doing the kind of things that Philip was doing. So he makes the connection you know, between the laying on of hands of the apostles and the empowerment. So since the disciples empowered could not pass on this empowerment and the apostles eventually died, with time there was no one left in the church who had been empowered and none who could transfer the power. Paul even teaches that these abilities and powers would eventually disappear once the full revelation from God was recorded and preserved. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 8 to 10 if you're interested in, in that particular idea. Now this is the short version of the reason that we do not believe that God empowers people today with the ability to speak in tongues and to heal or to do miracles. Of course, God can do what He wants to do, but according to the scriptures, He does not in the modern age. With the Bible, we have all that we need to win souls, to build up the church, and to mature uh, the members of the church uh, as Christians. 2 Timothy chapter 3, 15, 16, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, and Romans 1, 16, all of these passages declare that the Bible is enough, we have what we need. You know, Romans 16, uh, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation. So the gospel, we have it. We don't need miracles to convert people anymore because we have the entire record of the New Testament. We have the record of the miracles. We have the record of the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, as we are studying, we have the record of how the church was established and the, the mighty works that the apostles and others did at that time. So those who claim to have this power, they do so in opposition to scripture and they have difficulty in demonstrating objectively that their power and their healings are similar to that which is described in the New Testament. So there are a lot of people going around saying, oh, I have this power, I can speak in tongues, you know, I can heal people, but they, they can't do it to the degree and in the way that it was done in the New Testament. In the New Testament, you know, Peter, he healed someone who was sick, but he could also raise someone from the dead. Today, there are certain illnesses that can be healed, quote, and if they can't be healed, it's the fault of the person who's ill, they don't have enough faith, but that, you don't see that in the work of the, uh, of the apostles in the New Testament. For example, the miracle of tongues in the Bible is described as the ability to speak in various human languages not known or studied by the speaker. It's as if I began to speak Mandarin all of a sudden. I've never been to China, I've never studied that language, but the gift of tongues would be the fact that I all of a sudden would be able to communicate with the Chinese person in his own language. Okay? So modern day charismatics, for example, do, do not and have never been able to do this. They haven't been able to reproduce this biblical miracle in the way that it was done in the Bible. So we read that Simon, getting back to our text here, we read that Simon, he makes the mistake of trying to purchase this power from the apostles. And you know, it's, it's, again, it's so human, isn't it? He's falling back into his old ways where magicians, you know, they bought and sold their tricks and their deceptions from one another. 
But Peter severely rebukes him and admonishes him to repent immediately for such a serious sin, to try to purchase the blessings of God. Now he was probably spared because he was a young Christian. He acted impetuously. You know, the, uh, when he talks about the gall of bitterness, the gall of uh, bitterness and the bondage of iniquity are two references that mean kind of the same thing. Simon's sinful attitude, you know, the gall of bitterness, that's the bad fruit, is a bond that firmly holds him um, captive. All right, he needed to repent of that. His response, of course, shows that he takes this seriously because he appeals to them. He appeals to the apostles to pray on his, uh, on his behalf. And so uh, we move on with another um, example, another story involving Philip. He includes this second account of Philip's ministry, this time to a Gentile convert to Judaism from Africa. Note that uh, Philip's evangelism ministry was quite dynamic in that he was already reaching out beyond the borders of the Jewish nation with the gospel message, first to the Samaritans and now um, uh, to, a, um, uh, to a Gentile proselyte to the Jewish faith. In other words, uh, someone who was, a, who was not born a Jew, he, uh, he was a Greek, a Gentile, but he had been converted to uh, Judaism. So in the story, and I think which is familiar here, uh, Philip is directed by an angel to this man who uh, the Bible says was a keeper of the treasure for the queen of Ethiopia. Not only a convert to Judaism, but he was also of a different race. He was from Africa. Luke recounts how Philip rode along with this man and answered his questions concerning the scriptures that this, you know, this, uh, this convert was reading. Philip uses this opportunity to preach the gospel to this man and the, this person uh, immediately responds. So let's just read a section of it in uh, chapter 8, verse 34. It says, the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does the prophet say this? Uh, and we, we learn that he's been reading the book of Isaiah. So it says, uh, of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. As they went along the road they came, as they went along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he ordered the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. So note that the eunuch's initial response after hearing the gospel was to inquire about baptism. I wonder why. I wonder why. This shows two things. First, the command to be baptized is part of preaching the gospel. So it shows that. And secondly, being baptized is part of one's response of faith to the gospel. Now one other point not mentioned in the story itself is that because this man was a eunuch, he was considered a proselyte of the gate by the Jews. And being a proselyte of the gate meant that he was barred from entering the inner temple area. Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 1. This made him a kind of a second class convert to Judaism, the lowest rung on the ladder of acceptance into the Jewish religion. With his conversion to Christianity, however, he became, as Peter later wrote in 1 Peter, and I want to read that, he says, but you, speaking of Christians, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So isn't it amazing, this, this eunuch here, he goes from being one who could go to the gate of the temple, but no further. He goes from that to becoming the actual temple of the Holy Spirit through Christ. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. 
Luke, uh, so we'll leave off Philip here. Luke now shifts the focus of his narrative from the work of Peter and the early church to the conversion of its chief antagonist who was leading the persecution against them. And that was Saul of Tarsus. So let's begin, let's go back to Acts, begin chapter nine. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you uh, persecuting me? So I'll just stop right here for a moment. Note that uh, Saul was not merely an opponent of the religion and had kind of you know, theological objections or theoretical objections to this faith. He was, he was out to destroy it as a religion and kill or imprison those who practiced it. I mean, he, he had been confining uh, his attacks in and around Palestine, but was now expanding his attacks uh, outside the country. That he sought authorization from the Jewish leaders to arrest and imprison Jewish converts to Christianity in another city um, uh, confirms two things. One, that the Jewish leadership was complicit in the persecution of Christians. And two, Saul was their official leader um, in charge of this effort. So let's keep uh, reading verse three and four I just read, and we go on to five and seven, and he said, who are you, Lord? So, so, so Saul now has a, a vision. Uh, Jesus appears to him and he says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but get up and enter the city and it'll be told to you what you must do. The men who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground and uh, though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. And leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So God chose the gospel's chief enemy to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul's encounter with Christ stops his persecution and renders him uh, helpless. He spends several days fasting and praying. And you know what? As a devout Jew, that's exactly what a devout Jew would be doing in circumstances like these. Uh, God gives him three days to ponder Jesus' question, why are you persecuting me? Saul's, uh, Saul rather was so sure of his mission you know, to destroy Christianity because it's, it, it was false and it was a threat to Judaism that he was willing to kill and imprison both men and women all in good conscience. I mean, he, he, he believed he was right was on his side. Saul must have also wondered what God would have him do. Luke now introduces another character and the task that this man was given to perform. So we keep reading. Now there was a disciple of Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has the authority from the chief priest to bind all who call in your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias departed and entered the house and after laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he regained his sight and he got up and was baptized and he took food and was strengthened. So in this section, Luke gives some background on Ananias and his struggle to believe God concerning Saul and what God wanted Ananias to do. 
Now in chapter 22, we find out that Ananias preached the gospel to Paul and then baptized him. Yet another biblical example of a person immediately responding to the gospel with baptism as the initial expression of one's faith in Jesus. Now if you put this account with the one in chapter 22, there's an order in Saul's conversion that emerges. First of all, he's called, miraculously, but he's called by Jesus. Then he is taught the gospel by Ananias. Then he is baptized in order to remove his sins, especially the murder of Stephen and the, the violence toward other Christians. And then we find out he begins to minister. He begins to preach, actually a little too soon. By removing Saul as an aggressor, the church once again has a period of peace and growth. So we keep reading verse 20. Now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, Is this not he who in Jerusalem destroyed those who called on this name and who had come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the, um, before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived at Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. When many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. So Saul, because of notor uh, notoriety and, 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 and the grasp of his scriptures, he, he, he immediately becomes a defender of the faith and is successful as a preacher. I mean, people want to see him. This is Saul. You know, the inquisitor converted to Christianity. And in addition to that, he knows the scriptures. He's mighty in the scriptures. So he's, a, he's, he's giving a mighty witness. Just as Jesus and Peter did, not Philip because he served in areas where the Jewish leaders had no authority or they had armed guards, you know, in Samaria and Damascus, Saul runs into opposition from the leading Jews who are plotting to kill him for preaching Christ. So just as Peter and, and, and Jesus ran into trouble, is the point I'm making, as they preached in their area, and Philip didn't have trouble because he was preaching in Samaria where the, you know, the, the Jewish leadership had no authority, Paul is preaching in the synagogues in Damascus. And so he runs into trouble with the Jewish leadership uh, in that area. So they report, uh, excuse me, they resort to this tactic because they are unwilling and unable to debate or humiliate or even distract him. So Luke describes how Saul grew stronger as their attacks grew more vicious and eventually he makes his escape as his friends lower him in a basket to escape from Damascus and he makes his way to the city of Jerusalem. We continue reading. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. And he was with them moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and then sent him away to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Now some scholars believe that Saul returned to Jerusalem after you know, about one to three year, uh, about a one to three year uh, period. Luke writes that this happened, that happened, but you know, we're not talking one day after another. You know, he, he leaves if you wish, certain gaps in, in time there. Uh, communications being what they were at that time. The news of him and his conversion may have been carried back you know, in bits and pieces. Suddenly, however, he reemerges and immediately wants to worship and associate with the saints. But they're afraid, not believing that he you know, is a true convert. Uh, perhaps this was a trick in order to spy on them or to continue 
the persecution. And so Barnabas, another character that we're familiar with, that we met back in Acts chapter four, Barnabas, who has access to the apostles, brings him to them to substantiate his story. Once they give him their blessing, he is accepted. And he continues his teaching and debating ministry among the Jews as he had done in Damascus. Of course, the same thing that happened there, you know, the plan to kill him you know, back in Damascus, happens in Jerusalem. This time plotted by the Hellenistic Jews, the same group that stoned uh, Stephen to death. Luke writes that uh, the brethren uh, brought him out of the city safely and sent him back to friendlier confines of his home, uh, hometown in Tarsus. Luke finishes this section by describing the pace and peace and growth of the church experienced now that their chief opponent, Saul, had been converted and was ministering far away in the north in his own city. Saul was no longer persecuting the church and was no longer in Jerusalem acting as a kind of a lightning rod for his previous masters in the Jewish leadership and others, the Hellenistic Jews for example, uh, giving them an excuse to continually attack the church. Without Saul there to create friction, the church could grow in peace. Luke now switches uh, back to focusing on Peter and his ministry uh, he's going to again take up Saul's progress, but first there's still some important events in Peter's ministry that he wants to record. The first of these is the healing of a paralyzed man who is healed as Peter invokes the name of the Lord. This occurred in the town of, um, in the town of Lydda and the people there believed in uh, Jesus at the preaching and at the healing ministry of Peter while he's in Lydda. Then he receives a, um, a call to another town close by called Joppa, a town near where this time a disciple named Tabitha, and in the Greek the, the, uh, the name Tabitha is Dorcas, uh, this particular disciple, a woman, had died. The brethren appealed to Peter to come despite the fact that she was already dead, demonstrating their great faith in the power that he had to do miracles. Peter arrives there, he raises her from the dead to the joy of the disciples. And this news causes many in that town to believe in Jesus. Remember, the miracles were always in, in service to the gospel. The miracles were there to verify the gospel, to, to get the attention of the people that the apostles were preaching uh, God's uh, word. Um, and so this news causes, as I said, a lot of people in that area to believe. Now these two scenes give us insight into the apostolic ministry carried out by Peter and others, not included in the New Testament. Peter's ministry being the model, if you wish, but not the only example. So you know, what, was the, what was his ministry like? What did he do? Well, he traveled throughout Palestine, preaching and performing miracles. Uh, his miraculous powers were unlimited. Remember I mentioned, unlike today, where people who have you know, the miraculous powers or claim to have miraculous powers, they're limited. You know, I can only cure headaches or I can only cure you know, arthritis type thing. His miraculous powers were unlimited. He healed an unbeliever with simply a word. He brought a believer back from the dead with simply a word. And he was not a, an administrator or CEO type leader. He was a shepherd and a proclaimer type leader. And, and I mentioned that a little while back. You know, it says the apostles sent Peter and John. That doesn't sound like he's some kind of CEO or top guy. You know. So we see that in the, in the New Testament. Again, a collegiate form of leadership, which was copied later on in the local churches. Always more than one elder, you know, collegial type, group leadership, if you wish. So in the next session, Luke is going to describe one of the most significant events in Peter's ministry as an apostle, and we will cover that next week. All right, so a couple of lessons here before we close out. First of all, all roads lead to Jesus. 
In teaching the eunuch, for example, Philip begins in Isaiah, where the eunuch was reading, and he showed how Isaiah's prophecies pointed straight to Jesus. Everything in the Bible is about or supports or leads to and explains the person and the ministry of Jesus. You can start anywhere and go forward or go backward. It always points to Jesus. So if after reading the Bible you arrive at the conclusion that Jesus is not the divine Savior, you have read the Bible incorrectly because that's its overall message. Uh, lesson number two. We all become Christians in exactly the same way. You will note all the way through the book of Acts, people become Christians by faith in Christ and a faith that is expressed in repentance and baptism. The 3,000 at Pentecost, they were baptized. The Samaritans who believed were baptized. Simon the sorcerer who believed was baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch, once he understood and believed, was baptized. Saul, the Jewish Pharisee, was baptized. The debate, you know, whether one needs to be baptized or not, that is quite a recent debate. They never debated that in the first century. There's no record of any debate about the necessity of baptism in the first centuries, in the apostolic church, if you wish, of the first century. That was never an issue in the first century. That's only lately, the uh, last 100, 150 years, where all of a sudden we've debated the, the, the role of baptism in the process of salvation. So the Bible is very clear on this topic and provides at least 10 examples just in the book of Acts alone that show people converting to Christianity were first baptized. So don't ever doubt the necessity and the role of baptism. Okay, so next time that we are together, we will, uh, uh, we will um, uh, read through or cover Acts, chap uh, Acts chapter 10 verse one to Acts chapter 12 verse 25. And I hope that you will uh, read that before uh, we get together next time. All right, thank you very much for your, for your attention. God bless you.